Okay, we'll start in a few minutes. Just I'm Robert Dijarik, Temple University, Japan. Um, if you haven't got an invitation from us directly, give us your business cards, and also you're strongly encouraged to donate money to our donation boxes. Uh, the enforcers will show up fairly quickly. Uh, and I'm extremely happy to have Eva Leeds, who was a professor at TUJ in... Uh, two th seven through nine. 2007 to 2009. Unfortunately, she's now back. I mean, fortunately for her students, but unfortunately for us, she's back at Moravian College. Uh, but she is here in Tokyo for the summer teaching at... No, not teaching. Okay, so hmm. studying, researching. Yes. And uh, she would enlighten us, I think, right now, because we were in Japan, we start on time or before time on the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, assuming, assuming that the bid is not invalidated after the investigations <laughs> that are going on. Uh, they will take place in Tokyo. They will take place in Tokyo. That's good. <laughs> they will take place, and Boris will be prime minister. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the floor yeah. is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I'm very happy to be back at TUJ. And uh, I will be talking about the uh, Tokyo, upcoming Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Um, we all agree, whether we like it or not, that the Olympics are a wonderful spectacle. Economic studies, however, indicate that the games do not have a positive impact on the economy. Right? A study has shown, in addition, that all Olympic games run over budget, at least by 100%. So the puzzle that I'm addressing in my talk is, given the lack of positives, and some considerable cost concerns, why do cities bid to host Olympic Games? Okay. My talk comes in two parts. First, I will uh, address the political economy of the decision making, and then I will look at the revenues and cost of the Olympics and evaluate the economic impact of the Olympics. So uh, my main uh, uh, model through which I see the decision making about the Olympics is the public choice literature. Uh, Mankiw Olson in 1964 observed that collective action, that is the action of a group, produces a public good. Right? And economists uh, classify public goods as goods that can be enjoyed enjoyed in common, there's consumed in common, and that cannot be, f from which no individual can be excluded. Right? So typically we think, think of uh, matters like streets, you can be prohibited from enjoying the street, uh, and uh, you can be pr uh, prohibited from uh, uh, enjoying it without payment, and you can enjoy the street along with other people as long as the street isn't crowded. So similarly, all group members benefit from common action, okay? but they cannot necessarily be compelled to pay. So we observe that free markets underproduce public goods, and that's really why the government has to provide things like streets, build roads, because people do not agree to pay for them independently. Right. So I use this observation and I, uh, I apply it to the Olympics. Right. So citizens individually may recognize that the net benefit of Olympic Games could be negative, but they don't lobby uh, against the Olympics. Why? Because they tend to free ride. They wait for others to step up and lobby against those Olympics. So just knowing that the benefit to you is negative doesn't compel you to act in a group setting. Okay? Promoters of Olympic Games are small groups. Okay? And they can organize more easily. Okay? They, can they can compel their members to pay. 
and they can lobby for staging the Olympics. Right? And so like all of us, politicians respond to incentives. So what's their incentives? Small groups lobby for the Olympics. The public as a whole does not lobby against. And so politicians, right? politicians then follow these incentives and bid for the gains. Right? So that's the main explanation. I will now look at the specific stakeholders in the process. Okay? So I have four groups. First is the International Olympic Committee. That's the most powerful arm of the Olympic movement. Okay? And for that, the Olympic Charter sets the rules okay? and for, sets the rules for all things Olympic. And the crucial element in this process is that the IOC does not pay for the Olympics. And specifically, it compels others to guarantee that it will cover the cost of the Olympics. Right? So in the bid package, for example, that Tokyo put forth, it had to provide the guarantee, among other things, there are lots of guarantees in that package, but among other things, there is a guarantee that if there is a shortfall in the Olympic budget, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, so Tokyo covers it, should Tokyo not cover it, then the federal, or here, national government has to provide a guarantee of covering those payments. Okay? Um, I will return to the goals of the IOC at the end of, uh, toward the end of my talk. Okay. Next, uh, consider the voters. Okay. Uh, they have potentially conflicting goals. Okay. One of them is patriotism. Right? We all love the city where we were born. We love our country. We want to show off. We want the world to see how wonderful we are. All right, let's go stage the Olympics. But as concerned citizens, we're also uh, worried about our taxes. And we know that the Olympics are expensive. And we know that in the end, the taxpayer covers the cost of the Olympics. We should not want the Olympics in our city in that sense. And we should be ready to lobby uh, uh, against them. In fact, many countries, I should say many cities, have uh, have taken, have organized referenda, and citizens in those cities have voted against staging of the Olympics. So that's uh, occurred in several countries, in Krakow, Poland, for example. It happened in Switzerland, in St. Moritz. It happened in Austria. Uh, in Munich, uh, citizens voted against holding the Olympics. These are all the Winter Olympics. In Hamburg, uh, so these are the, the, uh, the 22 Olympics. The uh, uh, citizens in Hamburg voted against staging the 24 Summer Olympics. Right? So this is, uh, uh, however, this ha didn't happen in Japan. So this didn't happen prior to the 2020 bid. Right? So I. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a quote, popular referenda are not well established in Japan. Why not? Okay. Well, there is a local autonomy law, and that local autonomy law allows local referenda. So if 2% of voters okay, uh, uh, sign a petition to conduct a referendum, okay, then a referendum may take place, but the local legislature doesn't have to sponsor it just because 2% of people uh, petition to, uh, to conduct a referendum. Okay? Even if the referendum takes place, the local government is not compelled to follow uh, the decision of the referendum. So there are uh, sort of the, the, the process does not favor the uh, popular referendum. There are referenda that, for example, the mayor can take, but these are voter-initiated referenda. Okay? 
Uh, the first uh, popular referendum in Japan took place in Maki, and um, the first referendum in the Tokyo area took place in 2013 in Kodaira. Uh, but as of 2013, which is when, to uh, when Tokyo bid on the Olympics, there were no Tokyo-wide referendums. Therefore, a referendum in Tokyo against the Olympics would have been very complicated. Okay? Politicians. Uh, you're probably familiar with the, with the local po uh, po uh, politics. So uh, Shintaro Ishihara, is really the person who pushed for the Tokyo Olympics and in part he did it because of patriotic reasons. He saw the Olympics in Beijing and, in fa and wanted, in fact, he wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, bid against those as well. He, that didn't happen, so he wanted the 2016 Olympics. And as you know, Tokyo became a candidate city, but did not win the bid. Um, he then, the minute he lost that bid, he uh, headed the Tokyo 2020 bid committee. And uh, what does the city have to do to actually win? So the ne as, as I have indicated, the necessary condition is financial guarantees. So in 2011, uh, the... Um, the diet passed a sports law, and the sports law included guarantees that the national government would cover any shortfall in the Olympic uh, revenue. But the guarantees are just a necessary condition. They are not a sufficient condition. The bid has to appeal to the IOC. So what did Tokyo do in that bid? Tokyo said, we have the greatest plan. It will be a compact plan. Uh, Two-thirds of the facilities will be within the eight-mile uh, eight radius of the Olympic Village. Okay? And this was, I think, one of the factors that appealed to the IOC, and so Tokyo won that bid. Okay? After the Olympics, the bid committee uh, morphs into the Olympic, uh, Olympic um, Committee for Organizing the Games, and uh, you, uh, you can ask me some questions about this uh, uh, in the session. Presence of corruption. Um, uh, there is um, sort of it's 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 um, all right. There has been some corruption. Uh, so the first um, uh, um, Ishihara resigned on his own because he wanted to form a political party. Inase resigned because he, there was a questionable loan that he took. Um, but he was a booster of the Olympics, and he was present in Buenos Aires when Tokyo won the uh, bid in September of 2013. Masuzoa is current topic, of course, and uh, he resigned because presumably he did not use political funds correctly. He, uh, it's not a question of using the public money. He, right, it, was the, it was the political contributions that he used for personal reasons and maybe inappropriately. I think what's important for this talk is that he was an Olympic cost cutter. He really wanted that my impression from reading the reports is that he really wanted to do the right thing for the Tokyo taxpayer. He wanted to limit uh, these costs as much as he could. Right? In that process, he may have ruffled some feathers. This is mere speculation on my part, uh, that, and that may have cost him his job, but this is speculation. Yeah? Um, so the Tokyo uh, or, uh, Organizing Committee was formed uh, in January uh, 14. And I think the name with which it's mostly associated is, sorry about the misspelling, uh, Yoshira Mori. And um, uh, Mori, this is probably public knowledge as well, is reputed to, to have some Yakuza connections, which brings us to the next topic, which is the construction industry, right? And the construction industry in Japan is a well-organized cartel. Right? 
despite that, it, and it continues to be a cartel despite uh, attempts at reform. And there is a simple interplay between the construction industry, the government, and uh, okay, the, the uh, political representatives and the bureaucrats. And that goes roughly as follows. The construction industry, right, because a lot of construction is a public good, you know, streets, right, uh, streets and roads are public goods, right? anyone can use them without payment and we can all use them in common. Uh, it is, how is it financed? People, we pay taxes and the government uh, finds uh, construction companies to build these uh, public goods for us. So the construction company is rewarded uh, projects and what does it do in return? In return, it, uh, some of the bureaucrats can retire into the construction industry. So, so, and that is called amakudari. I'm in Japan, this is, you're familiar with this. And the other thing that's sort of unique about Japan is that the political parties rely more on contributions from special interests than others. I mean, all parties n rely on uh, contributions from special interests. But it seems that sort of grassroots uh, organizations and grassroots contributions are a little weaker in Japan than in other countries, which then makes the special interests a little stronger and the construction industry is a special interest. To close the, to close the loop, we uh, see that the politicians let stay uh, regulations which then allow the ministry to mm -hmm. steer the projects toward the uh, building cartel. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, Japan has been called the construction state. This is not my, this is not my invention. So let me now look at some of the economic impact studies of the Olympics. To present a successful bid, the bid committee must argue that it can organize the Olympic Games very cheaply. And it must argue that the Olympic Games will have a large economic impact. I call this the Olympic magic. Right? So how does, uh, uh, how does that work? Um, well, with some uh, difficulty. Creating an economic impact study is hard because we must, iso so this is the uh, impact on employment and on GDP. To know what the impact of the event will be, we would have to know what, have, what would have taken place without the event. So that is typically, and that's hard to do, and so that's typically ignored. So in a study of this kind, uh, people may project how many additional visitors will come uh, during the Olympics. And they assume that any increase over the previous year is for example, due to the Olympics, right? They don't necessarily project, again, what would have taken place that year without the Olympics. Similarly, uh, many residents during such events uh, tend to leave. And uh, uh, as a result, there's less spending in the city. There is a lower economic impact. And so um, that too is frequently ignored. Uh, but typically what we find as, is that the tourist inflow is less than the resident outflow in an Olympic year. Okay. So um, uh, nevertheless then studies are done and I want to talk about some of them. So to evaluate the economic uh, impact studies, we now have to turn to the budget of the Olympics. And uh, the basic costs uh, and revenues are described in the candidature file. So for Tokyo to become uh, the host city, it had to present uh, its proposed plan, and that's the, uh, in the candidature file to the, to the IOC. 
And that candidature file contains basically two budgets. The first budget is the operational budget, and that's the budget for staging the games. Right? The second budget is uh, the capital budget, and that's the budget for constructing the facilities. Uh, and there have to be some figures attached to it, so the figures that were attached to the operational budget is 300 billion yen, and the second one, and that's almost exactly what appeared in the file, the second one was on the order of 400 billion yen. This is in uh, 2012 yen, so in, uh, this, this isn't adjusted for inflation. So um, those are the two big numbers that appear in that file. And how are they going to be uh, financed? So the, for the capital budget, right, the capital budget has sort of three parties that will pay for it. That is, three parties cover all the building associated with the Olympics. Uh, the Olympic Village is covered from private sources. So private, uh, uh, private uh, uh, developers build the Olympic Village. That is about a quarter of that budget. So that is a large part of the 400 uh, billion because the cost of the Olympic Village was forecast at about 100 billion. Uh, then we have the National uh, Olympic Stadium and that is covered by the national government. Everything else is covered by the to uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. So these expenditures started rolling in 2015, right? There was the destruction of the stadium and one of the stadiums is already being built, okay? Assume, just for simplicity, so we can sort of look at these figures, uh, that this will be a little over budget, so assume, right, round it up to one trillion, right? One trillion yen, okay? But there is yet another budget that doesn't appear in the candidature file, and that is the general infrastructural budget. So uh, when, um, when people consider these, uh, uh, these matters, they may consider the building of the new station on the Yamanote line as part of the Olympic uh, uh, construction. So, Construction of new roads, right? Construction in Tokyo Bay. That is, in general, uh, m even more expensive than the staging of the Olympics and the construction of the facilities for these Olympics. So that's about six trillion. There, there is other uh, expenditures. So let's round all of this up to about ten trillion, okay? And that figure will reappear. So that's, again, three different budgets. Budgets for organizing the game, building Olympic facilities, and building in Tokyo in general. Okay. Uh, so what do we make, uh, what kind of impact will this expenditure have? I evaluate this using a simple Keynesian multiplier. Okay. Assume that all of these expenditures are new. If all of these, and if you've had economics, then you will say you will feel very, uh, very empowered, right? So we take these new expenditures, we'll multiply them by a multiplier, that is, we expand them a little bit, and we get the impact on GDP, on gross national product. The first impact of the Tokyo Olympics was done in 2012, and that was by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and they said that the impact of the Olympics was about $3 trillion. Now, it probably took, I'm assuming now, that it took into account just the narrow Olympic budget. Remember, that was about $1 trillion. And so it must have been using a multiplier of about three. Keynes thought it was, it was about two and a half, and that was in a depression that was in the 30s, right? So I would say that the Tokyo government metropolitan study, uh, a metropolitan study, uh, the Tokyo metropolitan, uh, metropolitan government study is a little optimistic, but the order of magnitude is roughly right. There are other studies, uh, for example, by Mizuho Research that have a much more optimistic impact, and I will come to that as I show you one of the graphs on a slide below. The best 
study that I've seen is the Bank of Japan study that came out in this year. And that looks at the uh, impact of total expenditure, including infrastructure, and it makes the 10 trillion, for, uh, 10 trillion yen forecast that I mentioned before. So that includes not just the Yamanote station along with all the Olympic expenditure and running of the Olympics, that includes mess, things such as hotel refurbishment. So this study doesn't apl ap uh, apply a multiplier, which means the multiplier is one, right? And then this, uh, uh, the study considers this 10 trillion impact to be the cumulative impact of the Olympics on the Japanese economy. And so it, uh, uh, and so through the year 21, so, Current GDP is on the order of 500 trillion, and so when you spread the 10 trillion over the years, you get figures such as the impact in the year two, uh, two, 2018 is six tenths of a percent. So if this is truly new expenditure that wouldn't have taken place otherwise, then we get this increase of GDP in year 2018. The, I like the report because it's fairly guarded and it says this assumes that the economy doesn't run up against uh, uh, construction um, um, uh, bottlenecks, right? And that's a big if in Tokyo. So this report, that is, if there are huge bottlenecks, right, then this expenditure will simply replace other expenditure, and there will be no net impact. So uh, this report says for this expenditure to actually be additional expenditure, we need to have some labor market reform. We need to have more foreign laborers and laborers, and they have to have some labor-saving devices that allow them to be more productive than they've been so far. So if those conditions are met, then the impact on the economy can be about 10 trillion. Otherwise, nothing more is produced, maybe prices will rise. Okay. So here I want to show you that uh, two things, this is uh, GDP in nominal GDP in Japan for the last 20 years and you can see that there is a no long run trend. There is however a short, there appears to be a short run trend. And so studies like Mizuho that are very optimistic about the economy and think that the Olympics is going to be a huge impact on the Olympics. In fact, they forecast that GDP in year 2020 would be up to 600 billion, uh, 600 trillion uh, yen. They extrapolate this trend. So that is one simple way of thinking about it. But if you, in, if you extrapolate, if you just extend the long run trend, you get no, no impact, you get no change. Okay. So let's um, uh, return a little bit to that political economy. Okay. Uh, the largest uh, cost overruns uh, associated with, these, uh, with staging of the Olympics uh, occurred, uh, have already occurred, they were, or potentially occurred, they were associated with the National Olympic Stadium. So that was projected to cost 130 billion, and as you're well aware, uh, the Zaha Hadid plan was scrapped. It was scrapped after the costs were, were estimated to be at least double the original, uh, budgeted amount. Some estimates were as much as 300 billion and there were public demonstrations. And the public demonstrations uh, uh, really uh, overlapped with the demonstrations last summer <coughs> against, uh, the, uh, uh, against effectively the, uh, the attempt by the 
uh, the administration to modify the pacifist constitution and the populace was, you were here probably, was not happy about that. So uh, this is a, a Shinzo Abe. Yes, the demonstrations caused Shinzo Abe to cancel this, uh, cancel this design. And in its place, in December of uh, last year, was uh, put this uh, design. Uh, by the way, one of the reasons uh, uh, why the public demonstrated against this design was environmental uh, implications. So uh, the, 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 um, um, uh, the stadium was thought to be just too big and unwieldy for the, uh, for the location. So instead we have a much more site-friendly uh, design here that should also be closer to the initial budget, uh, budget right? the amount that was budgeted for it in the candidature file for the uh, Tokyo Olympics and that was the 130. So it's just, just a little bit over, 149 billion. Okay. Um, the public has had an impact on some of the uh, sites in Tokyo. The Kasai slalom course was initially planned for something that was effectively a nature preserve. And a petition was, uh, a petition was circulated and it showed all the animals and all the, uh, all the vegetation that was within this park that would have been destroyed. And that had apparently a, a large impact. And so that site was moved and now it's just called uh, uh, Kanu uh, Slalom. And uh, uh, so this is as a result of a petition that was circulated. Uh, the metropolitan government itself, because of cost concern, canceled three proposed venues, two youth plaza arenas that would have been built in the Tokyo Bay, and Wakasu Marina also in the Tokyo Bay, and so now uh, sailing will be moved to Enoshima. As a result, the games are no longer compact. Um, that is, remember, that was one of the thing, one of the aspects that appealed to the International Olympic Committee, and so now only 50% of the venues are within the eight-kilometer radius of the Olympic Village. But this shows, I think, both of these shows that public protests can be effective if they have a narrow focus. Okay, what is the IOC's response? Uh, uh, the IOC is now <sighs> taking, um, uh, the IOC has noted that fewer and fewer cities are in fact bidding for the Olympics, okay? And uh, so I have here in, uh, two years and you can see how both the applicant cities and then the chosen candidate cities have uh, 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 been becoming smaller and smaller. Um, as a result, the uh, IOC has produced a new plan and the 2020 plan says we really want more cities to bid and so we'll make it cheaper to bid and we will uh, make it possible for them to run the Olympics for less. Okay. Why? Because without the Olympics, there is no IOC. The IOC must uh, generate right, some interest among the cities, otherwise it gets no revenue. If it gets no revenue, it's out of a job. So um, the IOC has accepted the reduction of Tokyo's bid, the, the, the smaller scale of the Tokyo bid, it has no other choice. That's called uh, moral hazard. That is once the agreement is signed, the, there is some risk that a party might not agree to all the terms. That's what Tokyo did and that's simply the risk the IOC must meet. So uh, in the remaining, uh, in about 10 minutes that I have, I want to talk about the uh, forecast for revenues, just, just broadly about the forecast of the revenues and cost of staging the Olympics. 
So let's look at the revenue projections for staging. Remember there are those two budget, one is for staging the games, the other one is for, the, for, uh, for construction. So in terms of the revenue projections uh, for staging, uh, remember that the games were to cost about 300 billion. And the IOC, and, and there is a list of forecast revenues, and that's as follows. The IOC promises, this is the only sort of uh, contribution from the IOC into this, it promises to give the city something. This comes from broadcast rights. Remember, the broadcast rights in, in the US, it's NBC. I don't know quite who, forecasts, uh, who, uh, who buys the rights here. Uh, but um, uh, the IOC sells broadcast rights and gets huge revenue and then basically divides it divis uh, divis up. So some of it goes to the organizers of the, to uh, of the games. Then there are ticket sales, that's pretty straightforward. And then top and local sponsorship. Top is uh, the Olympic Partnership. And as you can, it's 12 companies. Three of them are Japanese, Bridge, uh, Bridgestone, Panasonic, and Toyota. And, uh, and uh, that brings about 30% of the revenue. Past Olympics indicate that these revenue sources are not risky. That is typically what is projected, in fact, comes back in. Okay? But uh, we're talking four years from now. The world is uncertain. Uh, there could be another earthquake, and tourists may be afraid to come, right? And sponsors could pull out. But in, in the past, this has not been a problem. Okay? The sponsorship revenue comes, again, from this program. That goes directly to the IOC. And then there, the Tokyo 2020 has gold partners. And uh, they each may give about 15 billion. Then there are 23 official partners, and they pay about 6 billion. And so this revenue projection already surpasses the initial cost of the, uh, of the games. Mm -hmm. So in terms of just the staging of the games, we seem to be okay, but there, there are other, but we're not okay in general. Uh, then there are revenue projections for building. That's the construction budget, right? So remember that the National Olympic Stadium is nationally financed, so the national government is going to cover it. That's you in general. And uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, is to cover most of the construction, remember, not the Olympic Village. But the, there is risk in that because developers could pull out of uh, building the Olympic Village. There's something could go wrong with private developers, right? So uh, this poses a risk for Tokyo taxpayers. Okay? Remember that the Olympic Village is about 25% of, uh, of the construction budget. The problems happen in both of the past Olympics, both in Vancouver and in London. Eventually the taxpayer had to chip uh, some money in. Let's look at the cost projections. This is the staging of the games. Okay? And the, uh, the staging of the games includes payments for security. And that has more than that. That became a problem uh, in London. So in London, they ended up paying about twice as much for security than they initially forecast. Okay? Because of terrorist threats. That can happen even in Tokyo. There was so in the past, there was a terrorist attack in Munich. That's not likely to occur here, but there was subway sarin incident, right? So even in Tokyo, there might be higher cost of security than uh, projected. Uh, finally, we have some risks associated with construction. Okay? We have uh, uh, the cost of construction already started to rise last summer. We were here last summer. And there was just talk about this. Uh, there is clearly a labor shortage. I don't know if, you, uh, if any of you uh, have been to the recent exhibit at the Mori Tower, but one of the, uh, uh, one of the um, installations there, this is Roppongi, uh, uh, Roppongi 2016, uh, uh, the, one of the installations is pictures of uh, foreign construction workers. 
And so they have four pictures, a Vietnamese worker, and a worker, a Billy from Ghana, uh, one from uh, uh, Turkey, and I'm forgetting the th uh, fourth, but four foreign workers, and they t tell each story, this piece of art, right? They tell stories about their countries. So foreign workers are welcome for constructing uh, for constructing the buildings, and uh, because there's a shortage of native workers. And that is why that report that I mentioned, the Bank of Japan uh, um, uh, report, indicates that it's really important if these Olympics are to have a positive impact to have uh, uh, every form of the labor market. Okay? There could be other increases in costs, for example, the price of steel, and then we have some business cycle considerations. This is almost my last slide. There has been, you, some of you may have seen the forecast of the cost of the Tokyo Olympics from d December of last year. And there, the, the report goes roughly as follows. It's, it is a report by a, a, a Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and uh, I haven't seen it. It's only been reported on. Uh, I'm not sure it's publicly available. And uh, it says that the new forecast for the Olympics is 1,800 uh, billion yen. Now, it seems to include effectively the budget for Tokyo, that is, uh, and remember that Tokyo is responsible for most of the construction. So it says that the estimated cost of staging the Olympics rose. They rose because of the cost of construction, security, transportation, and highway lanes. So the cost of everything, including security, is rising. Okay? Now, that budget, so it seems to be this is what Tokyo is responsible for, but it's being compared with two things that are not directly comparable. So you may have heard that the, uh, that the budget is, uh, is six times more than the initial estimate. And so it has been compared to the initial estimate of 300 billion. Well, that's not the cost of the Olympics, that's just the cost of staging the Olympics, right? On the other hand, this cost has been compared to the cost of staging the Olympics in general. And so it's been con uh, compared to the cost of staging the London Games and the Sochi Games. This is roughly three times more than Sochi and a, a little less than London. But when you hear about the Sochi and London Olympics, it's the three budgets together, right? There was, it's the whole shebang. It's staging the Olympics, it's building the uh, Olympic construction and building the infrastructure around it. So it seems that this, uh, this forecast here is being fit to two budgets, neither of which it fully fits. So I can't fully, uh, I can't clarify this anymore um, because I haven't seen it because it's not publicly available. So um, this is here, a small upshot here that the revenue forecast is in this budget, right? That, uh, that was reported on, uh, on NHK, but the NHK website is down. Um, is 400 billion in revenue. That seems reasonable given the sponsorship revenue and the ticket revenue that I presented earlier. And given this total cost, there seems to be a one trillion shortfall. That effectively is paid for by the taxpayer. So in conclusion, uh, the budgets in Tokyo's candidature file were unrealistic, as were the budget forecast in all previous candidature files. Right? They're always too low. Right? The 2020 games will not have a significant positive impact on the Japanese economy, right? uh, because in some sense they are too small to affect a large economy like Japan. Tokyo's bid for the games was based on confluent interests of politicians and the building industry. 
The public never said anything against it, right? And given no notable pub, uh, public pushback, the politicians proceeded with the bid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, I will let you take the Q&A, and thanks again for this presentation. Uh, the way it works, uh, you should line up here if you want to be recorded, if you, for example, work for the Tokyo city government, want to criticize it and don't want to be heard or seen, uh, speak from your chair and you won't be recorded. Uh, so the floor is yours for questions. Thanks. Uh, what do I do? I get okay. So if please. All right. Thank you for a present. Oops. Thank you for a presentation today. Um, I was really glad to hear your presentation after all the times you've been advertising and it's on spot. Um, the question I have for you is actually regarding the e-commerce industry of Tokyo specifically um, Uber, Airbnb, and mm -hmm. you know, these kind of emer emerging app, apps that you know, make traveling much easier. Do you see a market in this, especially given the 2020 Olympics? And just regarding Airbnb, do you think that the, you know, Shibuya has the, um, released its um, restrictions on Airbnb, but do you see that more with other Tokyo districts as well? Thank you. All right. Um, given the plan construction that is um, uh, presumably necessary to house, I, I think this is what you're asking. All the additional, uh, all, all the additional uh, guests that are uh, uh, expected for the Olympics. Well, let me make a comment about about that. Um, the forecast, the initial forecast for visitors was doubling from about 10 million foreign visitors a year to about 20. But already last year, Tokyo had about 20 million visitors. So now the forecast is maybe maybe 30 uh, 30 million uh, visitors per year, and so there is need for uh, for housing them. So I think you're asking if uh, that is going to have an impact on the economy. And so if, uh, this, uh, if this ends up creating new uh, enterprises, it will have a positive impact. However, if um, in terms of Airbnb, if it doesn't lead to any more construction, then yes, it's going to have some impact. But it's not going to have uh, as large an impact as if as as if new construction were taking place. I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully un, uh, uh, answering your question. Um, just specifically, do you see uh, there's a huge market right now? Uh, last question, yes. Right, yes. For um, you know, this kind of convenient traveling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take the example of Uber. Yes. You, know, you, you try to have Uber in Tokyo, but you really can't because you have all these mm -hmm. taxi lobbying you know, against Uber. You know, yeah, that's sort of on the order of asking for labor market reforms, right? And I, I can't, um, maybe the labor market won't be reformed. So that is, there's a sort of poor forecast of the strength of the pressure of the taxi drivers, right? So, but I can tell you that if Uber, if Uber is uh, accepted, then again, it's not going to have a necessarily a large economic impact on the city because the taxi drivers are going to hurt. So it's 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 a for the for for, for Tokyo that would be a wash, right? So uh, no, and that's why the, the taxi drivers don't want it. Uh, please. Yes, uh, Rob Leffler, University of Arkansas Law School, and uh, visiting scholar at Todai. Um, I'm very delighted that you have dug into this as much as you have. I think it's a real public service that you have. Um, and uh, so looking at your conclusions, I think that they're all very plausible. Mm -hmm. um, 
but, and I don't mean to be critical at all, but uh, I wasn't fully persuaded by the top two. I think that, you know, maybe uh, the information that you presented um, is there, but I'd like to see a little bit more. In particular this, um, it seems to me that uh, um, on, for example, your second conclusion that the games won't have a, mm -hmm. a positive effect on Tokyo's economy, it depends a lot on the financial figures that you pre presented. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really rests on those. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I can't remember everything that you said, but it seems like a lot of this was uh, based on somewhat soft figures. Um, I remember that you mentioned that uh, you were rounding up and rounding up mm -hmm. for the operational budget and you reached uh, one billion, or a trillion, I think. I, six I, billion it, for, yeah. the, uh, for the uh, construction budget, right? right? And no basis for that. Um, so what I would like to ask mm -hmm. you for is if you could just give us, honestly, the particular areas where your financial figures were based on assumptions mm -hmm. and how firm those assumptions would be and where the assumptions um, might be questionable, then that can give us a better sense um, of how close your conclusion is to reality. Um, I. I'm glad I'm in, a, I'm in fact using the figures from the uh, Bank of Japan study. And so I feel, uh, and they really didn't do any, they didn't say they were doing anything different from me. That is, they were looking at the projected cost of construction in the Tokyo area. They were looking at the projected cost of hotel uh, refurbishment in the Tokyo area. They were using, in some ways, the figures from the Canada file, and that's how they came up with the 10 trillion. Given, I think, what I said about the difficulty of forecasting, all of this is fuzzy for anyone. And if anyone tells you otherwise, don't believe them because you cannot forecast what will be the new. Right? Because it's hard to know what would happen without the Olympics, it's very difficult to uh, know the additional impact. And so uh, I. And sorry that I, in some sense, I have to disappoint you. I'm sort of sticking with my 10 trillion forecast uh, as a reasonable figure because I have no, I have no basis upon which to make a more solid uh, forecast. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. Um, I think it's important though, to distinguish between the operating costs, mm -hmm. which are basically down the drain unless they're covered by additional mm -hmm. revenues that come in because of the Olympics, mm -hmm. and the construction costs and so forth, mm -hmm. which ought to count as assets in some sense because they go on into the future. Sure. So if, the, if, for example, the transportation that's constructed is going to make the Tokyo economy more efficient, then it's absolutely worth it. Uh, the question always is, is that what would be happening without the Olympics? Because, right? So that's another question. If the transportation improvement in the city is going to happen even without the Olympics, then we can't ascribe it as the benefit of the Olympics. But people usually, people usually do that. Right. So Maybe yeah, I, I, I don't think we disagree. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, if you don't mind, I think they want okay. you to talk to, uh, into the microphone. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. Um, I, so I, I, I certainly agree with your uh, perspective that uh, predominantly the uh, choice to host the Olympics is being mm -hmm. driven by special interests, which you mm -hmm. mentioned the construction industry. And the construction industry, the top four construction companies in Japan just recorded the highest profits in the last quarter since the burst of the bubble in 1991. So they're already seeing a very strong return on the investment that's going on because of the Olympics. I would add two more special interests to your, uh, your Please. group, which Please. is the uh, one, real estate developers. Um, so not only the construction companies, but the landholders who stand to benefit from these. Uh, for example, um, well, real estate developers and then advertising, uh, specifically Dentsu, which has been mm -hmm. deeply involved with this one mm -hmm. bit, and is also deeply involved with uh, the government and the Liberal Democratic mm -hmm. Party. And 
uh, Dentsu and also real estate developers, for example, have been uh, pushing uh, the, the government to deregulate zoning around the National Olympic Stadium since 2005. Um, and so actually they have been, and they've been pushing uh, simultaneously uh, for Tokyo to bid for the Olympics because the Olympics create a opportunity to develop land. Um, so I think that the, the government, landowners, uh, advertising, and construction are all kind of working together. Um, and all of these special interests actually are faced with the same uh, challenge, which actually, I, and from my perspective, is that um, Japan is it's getting more and more difficult to uh, create growth. And these, these interests are all dependent on the economy continuing to grow. Um, since 1991, the economic growth in Japan has been 0.9%. Um, and you mentioned that $600 trillion, or 600 trillion in figure that Abe has now promoted as being his 2020 goal for the economy. Um, in order to get 600 trillion yen, the economy in the next five years would have to grow by about 3.5% per year. And <laughs> because it's been 0.9% since 1991, uh, that seems you know, almost impossible. But um, this gets back to kind of a broader commentary on the Olympics, which is what I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned fewer and fewer cities are bidding for the games. Um, and it seems to me that the Olympics uh, are, in, in, in a sense, um, an event that is uh, very well tailored to the, the 20th century uh, or very high growth economies. Um, and you see so much in the 2020 bid trying to, in, a, in essence, relive the 1964 games. Um, the 1964 games happened when the Japanese economy was growing at 10% a year. And that kind of became the model for Seoul in 1988 and Beijing in 2008. Um, that doesn't really happen anymore. Um, and when you're in these, um, you know, these highly developed cities now, like Tokyo, the infrastructure investment, you know, we have this question, the infrastructure investment they're making might not have a good return on the investment because it's just not a growing economy anymore. So I wonder, do you think that seeing what's going on with, say, Rio and other mm -hmm. Olympic Games and the decline in the interest in post Olympics, is part of this related to the Olympics and mega events in general being something that is kind of growing obsolete for urban development or for urban economies? Is it, can, can cities really, can any city in the world now really have an Olympics that that works for them in the same way that they used to maybe in 1964. Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your comment. I, I think that uh, it wonderfully it it provided the perfect supplement to my talk. Thank you. Uh, so let me say that uh, uh, sort of take one aspect of what you said that the Olympics used to be wonderful, and one reason they used to be wonderful is because they, they were much smaller, right? So now the economies are growing, uh, are growing s more slowly. It's, it's sort of a trade-off, and uh, the Olympics, uh, Olympics are now a true mega event. Uh, but uh, in some ways we are, we are a much richer world. So if you think of the Olympics right, as a party, then uh, we know that on a personal level, we've been throwing bigger and bigger parties. So in that sense, if, if Tokyo wants to show off, and I, I don't mean in a bad sense, if, if Tokyo wants to show that it's still uh, uh, that it's a great financial center, it's a great economy, this is you know, it's a reasonable way to sh show it. It's not, it, it, it's not going to create the same effect. Uh, there is some hope that it might create the same effect as 1964. I think I've read several articles that they'd say, you know, there might be another generation in technology. There is, there is this connection to the uh, linear uh, Shinkansen, right? So there is this hope that it might provide the same boost, the likelihood of that is smaller. So uh, I'm simply commenting on your, on your comment. I'm not uh, resolving it anyhow. But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're richer. We, the world is a much richer place <coughs> than it used to be. So from that viewpoint, we could afford the Olympics. But the sense is that maybe it's too much even for the, for the rich world. I, if you, you feel free to ask again. You know, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, the, the organizers want you to step up to the microphone. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, you know, I wonder if there is a uh, uniform mm -hmm. financial justification for hosting Olympics. Uh, in case, let's say, Panasonic, which happened to be one of the gold mm -hmm. uh, sponsors, you said, uh, um, when they invest mm -hmm. platinum, whatever, one of the yes, highest, yes. right? When Panasonic invests to build new facility, they have a very specific financial models to justify the investment. Uh, one of them is what they call uh, maybe uh, they try to anticipate revenue and they convert that future revenue into the present value, net present value analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the mm -hmm. methods they use to justify the investment to expand their manufacturing facility. Now, same company, Panasonic, they have been platinum sponsor for Olympics for the last, mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. many years. But I don't think they use the same, same financial model to justify to be the platinum sponsor mm -hmm. for many, many Olympics. Mm -hmm. So they have a different justification, even though they are publicly shared corporation. So they, they obviously have different financial models for each mm -hmm. capital investment. Mm -hmm. And in case of Olympics, you know, they have, if you're trying to justify the uh, uh, Olympics from a financial point of view, I think we have to have uh, a sort of uniform justification from financial point of view. And unless there is a, so to speak, a, a, at the macro level, universal financial justification model, it's very difficult to say that the a Tokyo Olympics is not very really financial justifiable. London was good, Peking was good, so that's, that's my, my question. You know, I wonder if there is uniform or a worldwide shared financial mo models to justify Olympics from a financial point of view. I don't know of any okay. such model. I'm, okay. yes, I am not aware of any such model. I think that uh, uh, the cities, uh, uh, again, all, all they do is they just try to say, it's going to be very inexpensive and it's going to cre it create a large effect. There is no, uh, they have no additional models that they apply. Because no. there's no way you can justify independent of Tokyo or future Olympics mm -hmm. by looking at the short return from mm -hmm. a financial point of view. Well, maybe, maybe you're thinking of something like legacy, uh, legacy effects that you know the cities say uh, maybe there is no short-term return but everyone just like everyone remembers the Tokyo 64 and maybe that is the reason why have the tourists come to Japan right maybe there is this thinking well if we do the Olympics again maybe we will have a worldwide impact and this will uh, just boost tourism for decades Maybe you're referring to something like this, but I, again... It seems for me, mm -hmm. the, the numerical data you use are very short-term mm -hmm. uh, analysis. Yes. And I assume that there is no way you can justify any Olympics by using very, very short-term financial return. Correct, and so uh, that is, and that's what the ex post economic studies show that there is a, no short run return, and it, the problem is that there is effectively no way to measure the long run impact. You know, just like I said, there there are really both practical and uh, theoretical uh, uh, concerns about making a um, uh, an economic impact studies study. It's even harder to forecast long-run benefits of the Olympics, which doesn't mean they aren't there, but no one has put his fingers on it. Martin Kölling, uh, I have two questions. One is about uh, the sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, 
compared to other Olympics in the past, mm -hmm. is this uh, the Olympic Games with the highest share of sponsors? I think I heard that. No I other heard the same talk. I heard I was present at the also, same talk. Oh, you were <laughs> there too. You're right. So, and uh, also then the question is, of course, is it really justified that basically all the work at the Olympics is done by volunteers, basically, still? Uh, this is yeah. mm. my first question. And then my second question is uh, regarding um, the cost cutter, Masuzoe. Um, do you know of any uh, conflicts between the organizing committee and uh, the city uh, because of his cost cutting? Unfortunately, I don't. So that's just the second question. No, I've, I've only read that yes, he ruffled some feathers. And again, I think the best article I read was in the New York Times that he, he wanted to reduce the cost of the Olympics. I'm sorry, I can't give you any more, uh, you know, any more detail than that. Uh, instead of, in terms of the sponsors, I in fact went to the website and checked. So there are, um, uh, there, are four new, there are at least four additional sponsors since that talk. <laughs> so there's, uh, th there used to be 19, I think in the last month they got four more sponsors. And, um, uh, and, and it's also true that, in t this, there's this question about sponsorship and I also check that yes, four of them are newspapers. So <laughs> it's very unusual that the sponsors of the Olympics would be newspapers, but uh, I think the, uh, the Mainichi, uh, the Mainichi, uh, Nikkei Mainichi and two others uh, 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 are in fact sponsors of the Olympics. Yeah. But is it more than other Olympics? Um, you know, I didn't, uh, that claim was, I, I can go back and check it, yes, because I am sure it's available on the website, but I didn't check it for the talk today. So um, if, you, if you want to, you can email me, I can, yeah, we can. Um, but uh, that, that claim, I, I heard the claim that uh, um, I, I showed you that uh, there are 15 gold uh, uh, sponsors of the Olympics and then there are 23 official sponsors. And uh, the claim is that that is much more than in the previous Olympics. That is in line with your statement that uh, that the advertising, the dense of the advertising agents is behind this all. Uh, I, I have no way of uh, independently verifying that, but uh, I can go back and check the number of sponsors for the previous Olympics. So there are a lot of sponsors of these Olympics. Yes. Once again, thank you for your informative talk. Um, I would just say, to, it's my understanding from a marketing point of view that the, uh, the sponsorship is very valuable to those sponsors and that okay. they see it a, a good return on it from the sponsorship point of view. Uh, and there are some studies on that out of Columbia University. Out of? Out of Columbia University. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, but what I wanted to ask was, um, so you are arguing at some level that this is not good for cities. Do I'm, you I'm, see, I'm, I'm, uh, yes, I'm arguing that it's very costly for it's the very, cities. It's very costly for yes. cities. Do you, um, do you or has anyone else looked at the possibility that it would no longer rotate, that it sits down and is it an, an, a, a different model is used for that? Has there been any study of that is my question. Thank you. Um, that, that is an excellent question because a lot of sports economists have suggested that and clearly the IOC is uh, against it because that uh, reduces the revenue to it, right? That reduces uh, the bidding rights, that reduces the whining and dining by the or potential organizers. So the IOC does not want to go that way. So the plan 2020, so the, the response, the IOC response is this 2020 plan. Please keep bidding, we'll make it a little bit easier for you. But I have, 
I have seen informal proposals of what she suggests. That is that there would that, that there be permanent locations of, uh, uh, you know, of uh, the Olympic Games that they would rotate. Uh, but I have not seen any study of that. And again, I know that that's exactly what the IFC does not want, right? Because it reduces it reduces its power. Right. It reduces its bargaining power. Anyway, any? All right. Hi, my name is Fred Vaca. I'm a freelance sports writer. Um, just uh, a few things. In terms of, you, you're saying it's very hard to estimate the, the financial impact, but uh, the last sort of seven or eight or six out of eight Olympics have been in first world countries where presumably they have a, a regulated economy unlike say China or Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so difficult nowadays to estimate uh, the costs or the, the financial in impact of an Olympic Games and why, why are Tokyo so incapable of estimating their economy? Sorry, I, uh, the other one is about the economic in impact from London. Mm -hmm. um, Lord Dayton came here last year and, and suggested that I think there was a nine billion pound economic impact, mm -hmm. um, but some people say well, there was no economic in impact at all. So the difference between nine billion and zero is quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, again, how how, you, how how are people estimating these economic in impacts from you know after the games? Uh, you know, in terms of we talked you talked earlier about mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the stadium and legacy and. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the new costs and the legacy costs uh, are, are very different. If you can just uh, address those things. Um, there is, um, I don't, um, it's always difficult to forecast the impact of the event. So I think I am not suggesting that Tokyo can forecast. It's just in general difficult to forecast. And because it's difficult to forecast, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, Anyone, you know, it's like anyone's free to make his own forecast in some sense, right? I mean, forecasting is difficult. And uh, uh, I think, again, when the games were smaller, it mattered less. But now that they are true mega events, this does make a difference. And it has larger impacts, uh, larger impacts on the budgets. I think I'm missing one thing you, uh, you, you try to, uh, Answer you. You, uh, you asked. Uh, the impact of the. Oh, that's right. There is uh, yeah. So there has been um, uh, uh, in general, I think uh, people sort of look at whether there is something different. You know, when 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 people make economic impacts, they go back and they look if there is anything different about the uh, Olympic year. And when they look back to see if there is anything different in the economy uh, about the Olympic year, or if there is anything different in the economies that organized the Olympics as opposed to economies that didn't organize the Olympics, they don't find this way any impact. So they, they, it's, uh, yeah, so that's a zero, right? When uh, I think that the nine uh, billion estimate that you're you're suggesting was simply the cost of the Olympics. I you know I don't know I uh, I, I don't know of any specific study that would that would say that that was the net impact on the UK economy. But it's, so I yeah. Yeah, I think that's what they said. You know, it, it's sort of, look, that's in fact very similar to the Bank of Japan study that I, that I liked so much, that the Bank of Japan study says, yes, this could have a positive impact of $10 trillion, uh, 10 trillion on the Japanese economy, assuming this truly represents expenditures that wouldn't have taken otherwise. But the studies that find that there is no n net impact 
effectively conclude that yes, there was Olympic expenditure, but that simply replaces expenditure that would have taken place otherwise. So that's why the construction industry, that's, uh, as the gentleman here pointed out, that's why the developers want, you know, they want the games because they, they think this is additional expenditure to them, but may, right? But maybe uh, instead of the public uh, spending money on uh, more rent or more, uh, um, more sports events, if these expenditures didn't take place, maybe the public would go more and visit more art museums, right? That the, the expenditures, other expenditures would be taking place if this expenditure uh, didn't take place. So that's, I think, that's the basic argument behind why there is, in the end, no impact because these expenditures are displacing others. Think of it this way. Think of it, you know, Tokyo has a budget. Right? Tokyo has a budget and everyone wants the Tokyo government to spend money on something. So if it weren't, if Tokyo government weren't spending money on the construction of sports facilities, maybe it would have built more school, maybe it would have built more daycares, right? So maybe the, the money, it's the, the money would have been used for something else. And that's the, uh, that's the opportunity cost of having the Olympics. And the opportunity cost of the Olympics can, in fact, be potentially large. If you think that it's important that, uh, and again, using the same example, that mothers have, that all mothers have access to daycare, well, then that's the cost of organizing the Olympics. Those possibilities will not be there. Major, major differences, though, in case of Olympics. Many development will be taking place simultaneously. So let's look at the last Olympics in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. The Kawa TV, uh, Shutoku Highway, Shinkansen, all of these things were taking place simultaneously. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, aggregate of these investments produced huge return in case of the last Olympics. And I do not know mm -hmm. what the impact of this coming Olympics in Tokyo will be. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is that the, first of all, telecommunication capacity has to be increased dramatically to mm -hmm. accommodate uh, at least 4K TV mm -hmm. broadcasts, mm -hmm. not only for TV equipment, but for cell, uh, cell phone and all that will be taking place at the 4K mm -hmm. uh, high definition TV. And that uh, will increase the capacity of all of these telecommunications because of Olympics. Most likely, many houses will have either 4K or 8K TV because of Olympics. And there are a bunch of these which cannot be taken place by investing in uh, schools and many other things. That, that is one of the major differences. I think, yes, there is somehow hope that just like the Olympics I mean, I think you used the right word simultaneously. Right? So the Olympics were part of a, a technological push in Japan. So there is hope that somehow the push for the Olympics will spurn technological development that might not take place otherwise. And I think that, that that's a good, that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable argument. It's hard to say whether the push would have been occurred would have occurred anyway, right? So the, the the hope is just somehow that people feel inspired that there will be necessity for more communication, exactly the things that you're saying, and that might be ascribed to the you know on the plus side of uh, of the Olympics. Uh, but again, you know the Shinkansen would was planned regardless of the Olympics, right? So. I, I think both. <laughs> uh, one, I think, uh, you, as I said, many things were done simultaneously. Yes, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. Yes, and yes, that, that yes. That produced multiple yes. Uh, high return. Yes. Rather than simply investing independently. Oh, so I think, I'll say, so you're claiming that there are some interaction effects. Oh, yeah, obviously. Okay. 
but it's okay in addition to the simultaneous boom right that somehow the boom is stronger when you throw in uh, there's a stronger impact if you throw in the Olympics okay mm -hmm. please Thank you for a very informative talk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Svenja Bavir. I'm a business English teacher. I think you mentioned that there are some zoning um, issues around the national stadium, or perhaps? the gentleman kindly indicated there were zoning issues around the stadium. Yes, and the, the developers yes. are motivated to try to change. So I'm fascinated by this idea because for years I've been reading about development in Japan, and I understood that in contrast to the U.S., um, there are so few zoning restrictions. Yeah in, in mm -hmm. Japan, especially in cities, and developers are very powerful. Mm -hmm. So um, any comments about zoning restrictions, this would be very interesting for me, thank you. I've observed the same thing as you. I've been told there's no zoning regulation in Tokyo, but this gentleman, I think, can provide more and more detail about this, please. <laughs> uh, well, what I was referring to specifically is, you're right that there's not as much zoning in terms of uh, what uh, what you can use land for, but what has been uh, mostly um, deregulated in the last 25 years uh, is the uh, height that you can build buildings. Um, and so in central Tokyo, um, the height restrictions have been lifted in many, many places, particularly around station areas. Um, and this, uh, around the National Stadium area, which is a, one of central Tokyo's few parks, um, the developers uh, succeeded in getting the um, urban planning ordinances changed to allow them to build skyscrapers around that area um, in a place that would previously have been much smaller. So um, that's particularly how the developers uh, are able to realize greater profits from the land. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Where's, oh, OK. Please. Yeah. <clears throat> Siegfried Nittel, writing for the Austrian newspaper, the Stand Up. I think it's not the difference between the Olympic and 64 and, and uh, for uh, 2020 that uh, Japan in 64 <laughs> was a hungry society uh, and not, not really developed society. And um, there was a lot things still destroyed from, from the time of the war. And, uh, and it is very different now. Japan is now is an a old society and a, a wealthy society. And so this kind of uh, uh, feeling the people to, to look for the future and to develop and do things. And uh, I think this doesn't exist in this way. Uh, they, uh, and I think in this way, the, Things I, I'm not so optimistic that there is a great development, uh, would be a great development by the Olympics because the people don't want to change so much. Say in, in 64, they wanted to change. Uh, and I think this is not the case today, I think. I think you're indicating that the attitude of the public has changed. I, I, um I think you're right, <laughs> but I don't have any sort of, I, um, I can't fully confirm it, yeah. right? So yes, I mean, the, the, um, the you know, gro growth, has, growth has slowed down in the, uh, uh, in the developed world and people have started making it to have different expectations and different hopes for the future. I mean, that, that is true. You mentioned corruption at one point. Um, we, we saw with FIFA that oh. FIFA was a den of corruption. Uh, the IOC is not very dissimilar in terms of the business model. Yes. Uh, what is the risk that between 9 2020, you'll have a massive corruption scandal at the IOC that will reveal horrible things and maybe detrimental to the games, to the image, and everything? The future is difficult to forecast. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think what, what's, what's especially difficult, 
Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but uh, what's especially different, uh, difficult is to see if there is a complete break, right? So if breaks are, so it could be, you know, who, who would have foreseen that Russia would in fact be banned from the Rio Olympics, right? I mean, I think in a way that's sort of a break from the past. So uh, I, it's only my impression that the IOC is sort of nimble enough to step, to stay one step ahead of any internal disaster. But yes, there, but you know, if I had to bet, yes, there will be more corruption scandals revealed. The, certainly there is uh, the, 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 um, um, the scandal that is, uh, the Tokyo 2020 scandal uh, that went through uh, DIAC, uh, that uh, the bid committee uh, bid for marketing by a Singaporean firm that was led by the son of DIAC, and DIAC was a powerful member of the IOC who could influence votes in favor of the Tokyo Olympics, right? That hasn't been investigated yet. But certainly the current members of the organizing committee are denying any impropriety. They said, we paid for a marketing study and we got a marketing study, right? What's inappropriate about that? But who knows what, right? who, 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 who knows what else will, will emerge? I'll take the advantage of chairing to ask the last question. <laughs> Please. Uh, what are the quake economics? In other words, we get a big quake, let's say, a month before. Mm -hmm. Enormous costs have already been expended. Uh, is the IOC insured? I mean, I'm at the IOC. I'm mm -hmm. told, like, well, look, there's a quake. We, do, we just can't do it in a month. You know, that's, we have better things to do in Tokyo. Uh, do the advertisers get reimbursed? Can can a alternative site be found? I mean, if, if I'm at the IOC in Lausanne uh, and they tell me, look, it's, it's not an enormous quake, but it's bad enough that the games are off. Okay. What do I do? Can I just pick up the phone and call the governor of Rio? And you still have the, uh, the stuff from four years ago and can we all move there? Uh, can I do that in Beijing and London? Can I, do I just cancel them as was done for the world wars? And then, uh, what are the economics? Because when they were canceled for 9, 1940, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big business thing. No. I mean, compared to today. I mean, there was no television advertising start with, there was no television. But I mean, today, that's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of money on the line. And do you know if the advertisers have bought Quake insurance? Um, no, there is insurance. Um, I've been reading about, uh, you know, about the general financing. So yes, um, many, uh, uh, for example, the local committee can buy some insurance that some of the sponsors will pull out. Or, you know, so insurance is a possible. I don't know, and I mean, and in, in general, there is reinsurance, right? There is, there is, uh, uh, there exists reinsurance. I don't know if. Uh, uh, I do not know if the IOC is concerned about an earthquake in Tokyo. I don't think anybody who lives in Tokyo is concerned about one. I mean, we all know it. I mean, we all have, I think, if you go yes, to this school, yes, I think yes. all of us have a special yes. emergency bag. Uh, I mean, you're insured. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. you're insured against earthquakes in Japan. I mean, yes. There's, yes. there's not a single person in the Kanto area mm -hmm. who's not aware that he's sitting on a tectonic yeah. plate. Yeah. But I think you're asking a more practical question. That is, if there is an earthquake, and uh, where will the where will the Olympics be held? Well, okay, there is now. Okay, there there is yeah. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, something slightly similar occurred in uh, 1976 when Denver pulled out of the Olympics. And the IOC, oh, that's right, yes, yeah. Denver. Yes, the only you're city that has ever returned the games that has been awarded. Yes. Besides uh, Tokyo, like yes. And so what did IOC do? It did ask a previous host, in this case Innsbruck, to please host it again. So, uh, so the question would, 
my bet would be on London. <laughs> smaller. True. I mean, the, the uh, yes. logistics of yes. the Winter Games. Yes, so but London's just done them, yeah. so my, my guess, my guess, pure guess, right on the spot here, uh, I would go for London. Well, um, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Oh, it's you. wonderful to have you back at TUJ. We hope you'll come back very soon. Uh, and thanks, all of you, for coming. We have our last event of the season on Fukushima and protest music. Uh, it's on the 4th, I think. So, whatever, you can check our website. I should know this, but I don't. Uh, but thanks again, Eva. And, and don't forget your contributions. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.